Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Alphabet Soup. What does it all spell? I'm Mallory Price, and I will monitor today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, and you can see our previous webinars and this webinar on our website. Um, our previous ones are already up there, and this, this one will be up there um, by tomorrow. This really comes at the request of, uh, of many of you. Um, we, we continued to get feedback that there's sure a lot of acronyms that float around and abbreviations that float around in work. So this informational, uh, some of these ideas talks that we put out there are going to be relevant to everybody, whether you're competing in the government market or business to business. Uh, a few of them will be specifically focused on trying to work and do work in the uh, government space. But I think, I think for the most part, there's a universal application here. And thank you all for taking time. I know we're all in kind of a, uh, not kind of, we're all in a tough situation, uh, unique situations wherever we happen to live in the world. Just uh, we got to put our trust and faith in, in um, things turning around for us. So I'll, uh, we'll move forward then and go through each of these topics. So we, we, we turn this alphabet so because when, when you actually start listing all of the terms and abbreviations and things that we all deal with every day, it's, it's overwhelming. It is, it is really bizarre. So let's talk about this, why it matters. Why it matters first and foremost is that we have to, if we're selling and understand the terminology, research uh, the market, our customers, we have to be able to talk like they talk. We have to listen carefully and either a capture manager or a salesperson or even a customer throughout the meeting don't have a clue what we're talking about. Actively, we have to be willing to clarify and ask questions. It is not a sign of weakness to go ask them exactly what they mean by that. No one will ever be offended by that. We should never guess or assume that we know what a, a certain term or acronym or procurement type means. Um, we should always be tracking procurement trends, no matter what our market is, the changes, uh, how do we have to compete a little differently, very, a lot of us are in the proposal business and uh, profession, and uh, you know this, but we have to be very, very careful about our terminology in our proposals, uh, in our communication with our uh, prospective customers. We, again, it's, it's about speaking their language, using their terms and so forth. Okay, so the first, um, now, we wanted to get that one priority out there. It, it is so important for us to know and understand the language of our, our customer. So the first uh, new term, maybe to some of you, maybe not, is OTA. Now, we've invited David Bull on this uh, webinar, and David will be presenting quite a bit of this. Uh, he recently presented to a group of hundreds of leaders and managers of a, of a major company on this very topic. And so we've had to distill down about an hour and a half of a presentation into a few screenshots here. Uh, so we're going to let David go through this, but you got to realize this is a webinar. We're limited to about 45 minutes to an hour. So he'll go pretty darn fast, but uh, this is a really good insight. If you're not familiar with OTAs, David, take it away. Hey, Brad, Brad, can you hear me you, okay? And could you advance your screen? I think you may still be paused. Sorry, go ahead, David. Thank you. All right, so I trust you can hear me. Folks, other transactional authority. Um, like Brad said, it may be new to some of you, but it's been around since 1958. It was introduced by NASA in 1958 as an alternative. They're calling it an instrument that they but that may be used to engage industry and academia for a broad range of research and prototyping activities. It has come into play in the last few years because it is quick, it is fast, it is responsive, and um, especially in the DOD world where it is absolutely imperative that we get these products and these services to our warfighters in a, as timely a manner as possible this circumvents federal acquisition regulations or the FAR. So it's a non-standard procurement. It is not subject to the federal acquisition regulations. So it moves much quicker. It is not subject to DCA audits. So 
a lot of those financial reasonableness and, you know, did you go through a whole bunch of um, fairness and so on and so forth, that can be circumvented. So again, it's speed. It's able to be executed up to $500 million per individual contract. And for example, the Department of Army can can release as many as they want per year. They could release five or they could release 15. They are capped at $500 per, per opportunity, but you can see that we can begin to get into some pig dollars pretty quick. No limit in the number of dollar value that the DAD may execute. Permitted to openly discuss, there is something that is absolutely mind-boggling in a federal acquisition. When an RFP comes out, the only contact you're allowed to have is through your contracting representative and the contracting officer of the government. Here, that's totally broken down, and throughout the entire opportunity, you're allowed to interact and even get incremental feedback as to how your your opportunity is progressing. That's just unbelievable. And folks are not allowed to be protested. Now, we're starting to see some variations of that, but for the most part, they're not allowed to be protested. So, um, what are the benefits? Next slide, Brad. Um, the benefits are um, an OTA can allow for much greater speed, flexibility, and accessibility. So, what used to take sometimes I've been on procurements where from the start of the RFP, because it's such a large deal, hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars, it can be two to three years from the start to finally award through a protest and then actually being able to be created and built or whatever. Here you're talking weeks sometimes, months at the, at, in most situations, but it's an incredibly fast process. Defense officials can issue an OTA award in a matter of weeks based on as little as a 10-page white paper. Again, I've, I've issued, I've responded to proposals hundreds if not thousands of pages, and here it's a concept. It's a white paper saying, this is what we're capable of doing, here's proof that we've done it in the past, and here is a, um, uh, a rough price, and we are prepared to typically build a prototype in a time frame you, you ask for. And that's about it, folks, and that's a whole different mindset. It can also be used to design and implement innovative business models within the government that would otherwise not be feasible. So in this research and development, in this prototype development, now we have an entry point for a whole lot of small businesses and what they call non-traditional businesses, which you almost have to have on your team, that now suggests, hey, you can enter into this huge world of procurement, which normally would be so, you know, difficult, but now it's just, you know, grab a hold of a, a team member, which is almost a mandatory requirement, and off you go. 2015, which is only five years ago, one out of 38 Pentagon obligated dollars, R&D. By, you know, late 2018 into 2000, one out of seven. So you can begin to see the trend. It is huge, especially in the military arena. Any commercial or academic institution is eligible to receive an OT award. So a lot of small businesses, a lot of universities are getting involved, especially in the research and development aspect of it. All right. You can see here that uh, these um, agencies, NASA again, started at the Department of Defense, all branches, the uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, you know, the... Um, uh, the, 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 all of them can. So, and you can see down here, Federal Aviation, Department of Transportation, TSA is a huge, huge player in this for, you know, new, begin because of the speed and, and we need to protect ourselves and we need to give our war fighters the fastest, most advantageous products and services available. And so we can do this with other transactional authority contracts. Now, you'll see here that there's three types. And the first one is research purposes. This is for, you know, for academia that where the government is looking for some kind of research that will, for example, suggest how do we, how do we find a cure for this virus? That was, there was a lot of OTAs that were issued under that. Uh, how do we, you know, we want to come up with a, a defense shield across our atmosphere to prevent inbound uh, opportunities. And so things like that we get research for. 
And then what happens is, is the usually the first round, you have a whole bunch of people, perhaps maybe 10 or 12, that were kind of selected or that were kind of, you know, pointed out. And now they come up with a prototype. The government says, okay, in the terms of an Army vehicle, one we did not too long ago, they had 90 days to actually build a working vehicle. It had to, you know, had to put a person in there. They had to drive. It had to go through field tests and so on and so forth. And they went from 10 who originally responded that were obligated to provide this prototype. And then they selected three prototypes from that group. And so then the Army took these prototypes. They did field tests. They did all kinds of stress tests and performance tests, so on and so forth. And guess what? They selected one. And instead of having to go again through a competitive price, uh, you know, contract, you are allowed to award a sole source contract to the winner of the prototype. So in this case, the prototype selection was only awarded $40 million. That was money given to them to develop their prototype. But the resulting contract for 400 vehicles was just a little bit shy of a billion dollars. So you can see that you can have huge awards. Now, you can get special relief to go above the $500 million threshold for specific you know, purposes, like for example, vehicles. It would be hard to build that many for under 500 million. So there are exceptions, but the general rule is 500 million. So why are you, why is OTA so important? Because look at this, in 2015, you know, $665 million were awarded in OTA contracts. Now in four short years later, over 20 billion. And the expectation is that will double this year. So um, it's just an amazing vehicle. It's speed, it's quick, it's responsive. And first and foremost is, is it helps us stay competitive with typically our uh, enemies and our adversaries in, in global combative markets, which in the past we have been so slow to the market, we were losing that effort. Now we are competitive again. So that's it, Brad, in a very short time frame of OTAs. There you go. Thank you, uh, David. Very informative. Uh, probably new for some people. Um, maybe review for others. And I, I just want to emphasize that David used a lot of, um, you know, military defense type examples. And uh, I, I just want to also mention there's a whole lot of IT, IT services uh, procurements that are also going toward OTA. Um, and uh, so those of you that compete in that market space should, if you're not, should become familiar with this uh, this type of transaction uh, because it it is coming um, coming at us fast and furious. And as the world changes, as we're living today and breathing the very experience we're talking about, major global changes in the world, there's got to be ways the government can procure products and services better, faster, and more efficiently. And here's one. So we, we've got to be aware of, uh, of these new vehicles. So Brad. And, yes, go ahead. Um, we had a question come in. So where do we find OTAs advertised or announced? Um, I will comment first and then David can, but some of you might subscribe to Dell Tech, their GovWin IQ uh, system where um, they track opportunities and publish as much information as they can publicly find. There are other type services, you know, there's Bloomberg government and others. You can actually write it on, I can't speak for all of them. I can only speak for Dell Tech, WNIQ. There is a filter you can set when you go search programs and opportunities that are pre-RFP and, and pre-release. And it will pull up a whole bunch based on whatever filters you select. And so I know here at Shipley, uh, that's one thing we're tracking and tracking very closely. We want to know, at least from that resource, 
that we subscribe to, what OTAs are coming up and which companies might uh, possibly be, be looking to bid those. So that's one source. David, I ask, is, there a, is there a government website that would publish these? I, I honestly don't know. Not, not per se, Brad, and, and here's something I couldn't go into because this gets into the weeds in a hurry. But in the past and still today, a, 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 a group of companies surround, you know, that are formed for a specific region, for example, ammunition or military vehicles or space, they form a consortium. And so if you go on the web and look up consortiums, you're going to come up with probably 30, 40, 50, 60 websites that are consortiums predominantly for OTAs. $50 annual membership, and then you have exclusivity to being considered for part of that uh, group's consortium. So, for example, if the space is looking at space radar or space sensors, they will go to so SOFIC, and they will, there's 700 members in SOFIC, and they will go to that, and they will look at who has these kind of credentials, and they will send out kind of a letter of interest to say, hey, we're the the Air Force is coming up with this bid, are you interested? So some of these will not even really get out to the general public because they want to limit it to people who have declared this as their uh, core competency. And so the, the government feels very, very good that they have the right audience to release these two. And so consortiums still play a huge role they sometimes were going around them, but consortiums still play a huge role in the execution of OTAs. So a business strategy then, David, is for, for several businesses is start early and, and get, get aligned with those consortium, get accepted. Um, it, it's kind of like winning a blanket contract, right? Then that gives that you the right to bid. Is that accurate? It, it, yeah. So for some, if they go through a specific consortium, you know, you would not have the right to bid unless you are part of this consortium. You know, for example, you know, this, this, this space layer, SSL, it was called not too long ago. You had to be part of that consortium to be allowed to bid. And so, you know, like I said, it, that one started with 12, down select to three. And then the winner, you know, the prototype was was a concept. It really wasn't. You couldn't go out and launch a whole bunch of rockets and put it up there to test it. But you you had prototypes of the sensors. And then once they were confident that you could protect that that atmosphere, awarded contracts, and these were huge. Great, Mallory. Are there other questions on this topic uh, before we move ahead? I did have one question. I'm kind of wondering about what an OTA looks like. Is it kind of like a letter proposal or is it a little different? It's It comes out kind of like a letter proposal, yeah, and you submit a white paper, um, you know, often 10, 15, 20 pages, and it's, it's, there are no formal requirements like you would see in a work breakdown structure or a performance work statement or a statement of objectives. You just don't see that. It's a concept. They are, they are asking for you to give them your best ideas. And so the benefit to the government is, is they might see five or six or seven variations. And so this prevents, again, um, the uh, protest because now they can select. And so they get these prototypes from you. When they down select, they will see a prototype that they like or they'll say take three or four and you will have to build this concept or build this piece of equipment or, you know, develop this prototype. And so then they have the use of this prototype for 30, 40, 5, 90 days. And at the end of that, they award a sole source contract. So the answer to the question is the original document comes out as a kind of a white paper. And the consortium people will actually, that's who you submit your response to. And they take a look at it and they say, ah, it's kind of weak. You might want to beef it up here. Ah, this looks good. We'll submit it. But I mean, you know, they're helping you to further your cause and your concept to make sure everybody has the best chance to survive. And so it's just an amazing concept and it's being 
so well supported because of its quickness and its thoroughness and its simplicity. Uh, everybody really is liking it right now. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next uh, alphabet soup item we wanted to talk about, and this will this will be brief, um, but it actually uh, some of you actually submitted a question uh, about uh, LPTA uh, low price technically acceptable. So rather than just take our word for it, uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit of this is just one of many um, commentaries that are out there that you can find as well that. Um, let me just uh, read this uh, as you read along uh, from a commentary from the Washington Technology back in January. LPTA is an acronym well known across government contracting space. LPTA is short for low price technically acceptable as an evaluation method for cost and price proposals. In our work with contractors in the departments of commerce, defense, state, homeland, security, and veterans affairs, as well as independent agencies, and then they list some, we've seen LPTA from several key angles, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm guessing some of you on this webinar today feel the exact same way. So what can you realistically expect related to LPTA going forward into 2019 and beyond? So uh, this was your uh, one of your qu exact questions when you registered for a webinar is what can we expect? So let's see what their his response is. Many procurement officials in the government continue to perceive LPTA as a safe approach for proposal review, mostly for its objective evaluation criteria. The belief is with the objective criteria of the lowest price, the risk of a protest is minimized. Hmm. So we're equated, they're trying to avoid protests maybe by doing it this way. They also view it as a way to drive prices down. Unfortunately, that objective evaluation criteria can and often does lead to less than ideal awards. I want to insert my commentary here. I was at a, an event not too long ago uh, in San Diego and on the panel I went to, and I shared maybe this before, there were several uh, people from government agency source selection boards. And we were talking about this very topic. And many, many government customers, uh, agencies have, as it says here, <laughs> the, it, things have turned out less than ideal when they've selected the lowest price technically acceptable solution. Why? Because the risk goes up. So now the government is starting to say, is the risk of choosing the low price technically acceptable worth the money we're going to save? And so this commentary here from Washington Technology validates that, is it here to stay? Probably. Is it going to shift and focus on maybe a different type of procurement than it has in the past? Probably. The point we need to know and understand what it is, that what type, how it works, and early capture research is the key to prepare for this type of a procurement. And then the, here's the final uh, quote from that commentary we wanted to show you. So to put it simply, LPTA isn't going anywhere yet. It's here to stay for now, but it's likely to experience some adjustments in usage going forward, largely as a result of the increased availability of funds in some government agencies, which don't require them to focus on lowest cost. So I think in many cases, the government has been sorely disappointed in the results of awards they've made based on LPTA. So they're, they are adjusting. And I think you've seen it, we've seen it. Uh, David, do you have any insight or final comments on that? Well, I, I think, Brad, in a simple commodity, when you're buying in bulk, like telephones or, you know, pieces of equipment, where you know it's comparable apples to apples, it'll still be lowest price technically acceptable. But 
you know, as we get into a more mature RFP where it's kind of a, you know, individually designed huge solution, I think LPTA just doesn't, can't be used because it's not a fair assessment. And, you know, I think we look for value there and value will never be uh, associated with LPTA. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that was a quick and dirty overview of that uh, bit of alphabet soup. Here's another one, and uh, this really could warrant its own webinar. We actually teach two-day classes on this very topic, so it can get very complex very quickly. And so we will cover it at a very high level. But uh, this that you're seeing on your screen is is a way to kind of just through simple PowerPoint animation try to show you the the approach to establishing the PTW the, the price to win and I would add the price to win window CI of course stands for competitive intelligence why do we put those together because a price to win effort um, without competitive intelligence is almost meaningless what are you doing a price to win against if you're not taking into consideration the likely competitors? So this slide shows price to win as it relates to a customer's budget. So you can see horizontally there is our capability. You can see the price, the vertical axis going, going up. And somewhere in there, between the addressable budget and the minimum credible budget of that particular customer and between the minimum acceptable capability that we have and the maximum justifiable capability that we can deliver on, somewhere in that window is the balance between price and capability. And somewhere in that window is the price to win that we think we need, but we can only know that if we've done a competitive assessment and know what our competitors are likely bidding. Likely. We'll never know for sure. So you can see we've got to operate within that window. We can't be naive and just bid everything at the low price and, and think that means best value. The government's smart enough or a regular business is smart enough to know that's not true. Um, we've got to give the educated best value based on this analysis we do, which includes costs and price and a look at our competitors. So over time, if we're really strategic about our business, we will take this model that I just showed you, which is very basic, and over time, over the length of the pursuit, over, it will continue to evolve to where we settle in to a winning price at an acceptable capability level, something we could actually deliver on for that price. And sadly, not enough of us actually go through this exercise because it's rigorous. It's a rigorous exercise. It requires thought. It requires research. It requires challenging assumptions. Uh, even if we are the incumbent, we should be going through a price to win exercise based on competitive intelligence to see where we fit. So we have to not only think price and cost and capability, but integrated in that is the CI part of PTWCI the competitive intelligence. What is driving our competitors? What's their strategy? Maybe they're willing to buy this contract and make nothing on it or treat it as a lost leader just to enter the market space. They don't care if they make a profit on it. They just want to get into the game. If that's our competitor strategy, it would be nice to know that going in and not after the fact. You see just the simple little SWOT analysis down here. If we know who's competing, do we know where their strengths are? Do we know where they might have gaps? Can we ghost that? Um, so price to win, PTWCI, 
they go together. One without the other is incomplete. And so we just, uh, that's all we wanted to share there. Uh, and we're going to move, well, let me pause. Any, any questions, Mallory, that we should be addressing? Um, we don't have any at this point. Okay, great. All right, now, uh, some of you who've joined previous webinars, are, we kind of throw around a little term, I guess, a little bit of alphabet soup ourselves here at Shipley. We call the four C's of capture. And so uh, uh, I've asked David to uh, walk through these four C's again, and we'll do it kind of quickly because it may be reviewed for many of you. But if we're going through and, and we're, we're in the middle of a pursuit and we're going after the, the we're working the capture phase of this pursuit, uh, there's certain elements we can't ignore. So David, you want to take it away? Sure, Brad. You know, all this possibly is my most favorite slide in business development because for a couple reasons. One, you know, in my mind, capture the phase of capture gathering and capture intelligence is probably the most influential in determining and improving your probability to win. So done well, and if these four C's are, are researched and known, your probability of winning goes through the roof. The other thing I like about this is I don't care what business you're in, whether you're government, whether you're commercial, whether you're international, whether you're small, whether you're large, I don't care. These four C's apply to business, period. It doesn't have a, a flavor or a, a nationality or a preference. It is simply business. The first one is how well do we know our customer? The C there is the customer. And if you are relying on just you know knowing what their needs are based on the needs outlined in the RFP, you are at a disadvantage because everybody else knows those needs. So we are looking for things like what can we learn from our incumbency if we are that, that discriminates and differentiates us from our competition. We need to know what's behind the needs that they're asking for. So understanding the customer and what their needs are is the first one. The second one is the competition. And, and you know, Brad began to further this idea with price to win. It's not just enough to know who the competition is, but you need to know the makeup of the competition. You know, need to know their solution. It just doesn't do you any good to know that these four or five people will probably, or these four or five companies will probably compete. That's good information. What is better information is what is their solution? How is it going to be priced? Where are its strengths and where are its weaknesses? And how do we line up with that? The third one is kind of a C squared. So you get a two for here. And it's our core competencies. And OK, so we know the customer. We know what their needs are. We know the competition. And we know what they're capable of. Now we kind of have to take a look at, can we compete? And we have to be very honest here, folks. A lot of times we'll have a business plan or we'll have senior leadership saying, hey, we're behind on numbers and so we need to bid everything that comes up that even looks remotely possible to win. And I can't tell you how many proposals I've worked on where the more we've gotten to know the proposal, the more we realize this is not what we should be doing and we may not do well at this even if we were to win it. So we need to understand what our core competencies are and what it will take to play in this arena. And so a very thorough understanding of our people, our, you know, our production capabilities, so on and so forth. And then finally, as Brad just alluded to, what's the cost? The C is the cost there. And so you need to understand, boy, you know, can I make a profit? Do I need to buy my way into it now so that down the road I can make a profit? Is it a bottoms up, top down strategy? All of those things need to come into play. So the customer, the competition, the core competency, and the cost, those are what we affectionately call the four C's. And like I said, the more you understand and know and define those early on, the higher your chances and probability of win will be. Am I doing this one, Brad? Probability of win? Yeah, well, why don't you go ahead and talk through uh, the, the probability of win, David? Some of the All right, key. folks. You know, this is kind of this is kind of a little bit, you know, it's it's not it's a gray area. It's not black and white because I mean there's some 
there are some targets here that we wish. And the first one is the relationship with the customer. Have you built trust? There are formal ways to know that, like CPAR, so that it would be your past performance and how well did you do? How well did you meet their schedule? How well were you under budget or on budget? And just how well are you performing? And this this can be done formally or informally, but is there a trust and, and, and is it a good relationship? That would be the first one. Past performance specifically with this. Now there's relevant and there is just applicable. If you are building airplanes, for example, and you've built a lot for the Navy, and now all of a sudden this is an Air Force bid, you probably have relevant past performance. The question is, is have you done it for them? And if you haven't, then you're going to have to build a stronger case and show them your capability because they would not have any intimate personal experience to draw upon. So you have to be very careful there, but it's very doable if you uh, work hard at it. Do you influence the requirements? You know, a lot of times if this is a new effort, is your relationship with the customer such that, you know, you gave them some guidelines as to, hey, you've got a big cybersecurity effort coming up. What's it going to take to make sure that you can ensure the security of this system and this is your core competency and you gave them a bunch of guidelines which now you see in the RFP? That resonates well with your chances of winning. If you are looking at this and saying, wow, we've kind of done some cybersecurity in the past, let's go for it, this is going to be a much tougher, uh, a much tougher uh, hill for you to climb. Incumbency. You know, we in the past, we used to say this almost assured you're winning. Uh, recently, we've seen information that says incumbency now is losing as much as they're winning. And so just because you're the incumbent, yes, it does give you some inside information that if used wisely and driven, you know, home well, uh, none of us really like change if we can avoid it. And so here is a way to say there's no change. One of the immediate risks that everyone else will face, you do not have to, and that's you know swapping out you for a new vendor. So you should be able to capitalize on that. But that's only if your relationship and your trust and some of these things, the validation of your past performance, some of the bullets above this, have been executed well and resonate well with the customer. Competitive influence, again, what's your posture in the marketplace? Some people will say, wow, you know, you are probably the best person for this. We're just not going to compete because it looks like it was written for you. That would be a good sign, but, you know, that's not always the case. And so you have to kind of say, okay, how can I influence the, the marketplace perhaps in strengthening my position by mitigating some of my, you know, minor weaknesses with a good, strong, group of teammates to build, you know, a, a team that absolutely on the surface appears that it can't be beat. Your competitor history, you know, if there is a way to delicately but effectually uh, suggest that in the past they haven't met their obligations, they've overrun, they've not been able to perform. Um, you know, I did some work for rocket companies and there's a new entry in there and yes, they're very good. But the company I went for was 165 for 165 in past rockets. You know, if you're wanting this satellite to go in and it's cost over a billion dollars and you want the highest degree of, of reliability, are you going to go six for eight with your competitor or are you going to go 165 out of 165? So these records are known and so you delicately suggest you have a much stronger past performance and proven versus the competitor. And then, of course, like Brad said, price and value. If it's LPTA, that's going to drive a lower price, and perhaps that's how it's going to be done. You have to play by those rules. But if it's anything else, if it's time and material, if it's, if it's you know, best value, then now we are forced to write a very compelling proposal that will suggest why, and that's based on our customers' needs, the four C's of what we just learned with our uh, in our capture plan and the lowest price that we can possibly give them where we benefit and they benefit. Great. Thank you, David. Um, all right. We're going to go to the, uh, the last uh, bit of alphabet soup that we wanted to cover in this short webinar today. And I'm, I'm going to go kind of fast and furious here, uh, but I think there might be some 
that are a little less familiar with this um, this term, this, uh, well, well, we'll define what it is here. Yeah, I, I call it, for simplicity, almost a sub-agency within GSA. Uh, so I'm going to run through this, and we will point you to where you can get a whole lot more information about this if it's, if it's an area you think you might want to compete in in the future. And you're going to see that it is growing. So FedSim, what is it? FedSim is a client support center within the GSA, General Services Administration's Office of Assisted Acquisition Service. So FedSim will actually run acquisitions, GSA acquisitions for them. All right, so they're under GSA. They actually run acquisitions for GSA. FedSim is the leading provider of assisted acquisition services for federal agencies. These are right off their website. So uh, we, we're referencing them and their website this whole time. Our services include acquisition, financial, and project management for the full acquisition lifecycle. So if I'm an agency and I don't want to run my own acquisition, I want help and I'm willing to pay a fee to FedSim for that help, uh, I will do it. I'll engage FedSim and they'll run the whole acquisition from, we, well, you'll see, you'll see what they do. So they are definitely becoming a more significant source of acquisition support within GSA. And here are some facts and figures they, they post on their website that we can't argue with. $35 billion total, value of active contract awards. This is no small number. Um, annual contract obligations, this is growing. Protest win rate, 99%. The types of projects that are that agencies are pushing it toward FedSim to let FedSim run their acquisitions. Here, I'm gonna just, here's, here's four, all right? Uh, here's some more types of acquisitions or agencies that are engaging FedSim. So you get you can see how broadly they're working their way into the, the federal government. Uh, the services we provide and procure, and again, right from their website, you can click into any of these when you go to their site. They do the whole acquisition management, financial management, project management, provide IT services, professional services, managed services. So they are really a full up end-to-end uh, -end acquisition support group within GSA. What uh, contract types or vehicles does FedSim already support? Here you go. They use a lot of government-wide contract vehicles uh, within their their acquisition management and program management. This, uh, I know this is small, this is the best we could do for a snapshot, a screenshot off of their website, but here you see examples um, of actual opportunities listed as of seven days ago, I think is when I pulled this up. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the exact programs, their potential contract value, uh, industry days, uh, due diligence is usually part of the acquisition uh, process with them. But you can see there are real live deals out there to be had. Here's a client testimonial from the Air Combat Command expressing appreciation for the way FedSim handled that acquisition for them. So again, this is, why does this matter to us? It's because FedSim will put out the, the solicitation for on behalf of the government agency. So we as contractors are bidding basically to FedSim. They're gonna, they're gonna do the awarding. And so they become our customer, um, even though the end customer is maybe Department of Defense or whoever it is, Air Force. So I'm not going to read all this, but 
on their site, you can see they've got a very well-defined acquisition process. So the step one is this uh, market research and acquisition planning. So again, if I'm a government agency and I'm willing to pay a little bit, I can hire FedSim within the GSA to run my acquisition. They'll start here, market research, acquisition planning. Then lo and behold, they're the ones that put out the acquisition, all of the required documentation. Uh, they, they release it for bids and proposals to prospective industry partners. You can, you can go back and read this on their site you know, when you have time. But this is why this matters to us if we're in the business of, of trying to win business from the government. This is growing. There are more and more government agencies that would like to wash their hands of the acquisition process, some of these uh, action items, and turn it over to FedSim. Look at that. They're actually the ones that are involved in negotiation and award. They're the ones weighing all of the factors and awarding the contract that based, based usually on best value. They provide internal legal reviews, and, uh, all of the briefings and so forth. And then I know this is small, I apologize, it's a screenshot from their site, post-award management. So they not only start with the front end research and gathering all the requirements, they do the post-award management, project management, financial management, contract closeout. So think, imagine you're a government agency and you're understaffed, and you've got some, some uh, solicitations you've got to get out there for uh, global security, um, homeland security, whatever it is, FedSim becomes a real attractive way for you to streamline and hurry up that acquisition. So uh, why does this matter in the bidding process? A lot of us, in this webinar, we, we are proposers. We're trying to win work. Well, it matters. Uh, the acquisition, the proposal still has to comply with the FAR. So that's a given. There's a lot of emphasis on these acquisitions placed on due diligence of likely bidders. So FedSim is going to do a little bit of a deep dive into you as a potential bidder to you know, see if you really belong in the game. So due diligence is a big important part and of, of the way they go about uh, soliciting. Bids and proposals often include a significant PowerPoint presentation. This is a big deal and a lot of our companies aren't geared up for this. Many times the main proposal is a slide deck and a briefing, and it's got to be good, it's got to be compelling, it's got to be clean, and sadly, a lot of us are still used to putting words on a page and paper-based. We, If we're going to compete through FedSim for work, we've got to be aware of this. This isn't your average 150-page document, PDF it, and click submit. Video is often a part of the submission and review. So a lot of companies have to actually find an outsourcing partner that can handle the technical side of video production. But we have to be the ones creating the message and the win strategies and making that compelling within the video. A written proposal is still part of the submittal. So there is still a volume or a few volumes that have to be done in writing and submitted. So what we're saying here is that the game is changing if FedSim gets involved and you need to be ready for it. You need to have someone that can put together some really good written content. Um, pricing is still important. They're looking for best value, but you've got to understand many times I'm not going to say all the time. Many times, PowerPoint and video become an important part of this. 
So FedSim will handle the acquisition from A to Z, including the closeout. So over here on the right-hand side of this, this screenshot, if you go to their site, um, they have a client toolkit. And they have a little short video on what they mean by client due diligence, client expectations, and then introduction to their technical evaluation board. You know, how are they gonna how are they gonna go about evaluating the proposal submitted? So I encourage you, if you think this might come into play in your business, please check this out. So fedsim.gsa.gov. If you uh, click around a little bit, uh, you're gonna find these three little videos under cl a client toolkit tab. And you can see they're short, they're very well done, and, and very informative. So you can learn more about FedSim if, if this is in your space. Well, that, uh, we've used up your time. I'm sorry about the rough start uh, technology-wise and, and my audio and, and uh, I don't know how Mallory's audio came across to everyone, <laughs> but I just, uh, I apologize for that. And thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Um, David, uh, masterful job as always, and uh, great insight. As we go forward, let's just remember that first rule, that first priority. We've got to get to know our customers, their language or terminology. We've got to know what kind of procurement types is out there, are out there. Always look for new and innovative ways to compete. We have to do our due diligence to know if we should be competing in the first place. And I believe strongly in this, that the more we know, the more we can win. And uh, you see Aristotle's comment here, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. <laughs> Uh, Mallory, I know when you first entered this business, uh, you uh, you were a little shocked at all the acronyms and alphabet soup you you had to learn. And... Absolutely, there were so many acronyms, abbreviations that were thrown at me. <laughs> so, because I mean, even I mean, the government has them. We had them internally. Company names are sometimes abbreviated. So. I kept a list to my side that I added to until they were all memorized. And sometimes I still do that because there's always new ones. Yeah. Uh, David, any real quick parting shots? No, Brad, I just, you know, it's like Mallory. We all have to go through that learning stage. And, and you know, like Fed Sims is relatively new. OTA is relatively new. L LPTA was new three or four years ago. We just have to stay on top of these things so that we can bring the best advantage to our customers possible. All right, well, thank you all. Mallory, thank you so much. And David, uh, everybody, please, please be safe, be smart. Uh, watch out for those you love and care about and uh, hope, to, uh, hope to have you join us again on a, on a future webinar. Take care.